Is it just me or are your Seton Hall laptops um, time getting faster and faster? Always. So annoying. But it now, Russell, just so you are aware, it now says that it's 306 on my computer instead of 259. <laughs> so I'm constantly either very early for meetings or I have no idea what actual time it is and whether <laughs> I'm on time or not. All right. All right. So we've got a critical mass here. You have 20 students on the call. Um, because we have um, such a big group, what what I'd like to do, it's, it's so um, I know it's a little it can be a little bit awkward um, for speakers when you're doing this virtually because you can't see how the um, people you're speaking to are reacting to things. So I always think it's nice to do a, a quick introduction so you can at least see everyone who's on the call. Um, and then um, they've already read a little bio about you and seen your LinkedIn profile. So I won't spend, I won't waste time um, giving a long introduction of you. I'm going to let you talk about your experience um, since you left the school and your leadership journey. And you can give any tips that you want to our student leaders about what you think is most valuable um, that they should take, you know, take away from their time at Seton Hall and what they should prepare for in the world. And then um, we'll leave some time so that they can ask you some questions, if that's all right with you. Sure. I know they I know they'll be eager to ask you questions. So um, so I'm going to just um, go down my list so we don't waste time wondering who will speak next um, and ask people to just introduce themselves. Guys, if you could. Um, make sure your camera is on and announce your um, your year in the program and what your particular interests are. I I would really oh, and where you're from. I would really appreciate that. OK, so we're going to start with Annie Hebel. Hi, my name is Annie Hebel. Um, I'm a freshman and I am from Pennsylvania. And what was else? Sorry, what else that we were supposed to say? Um, just something you're interested in. OK, yeah, so my biggest interests, especially in the area of international relations, are um, global migration and also human rights. OK, thank you. Danny, go ahead. Hello, my name is Daniela Maquera and I, I go by Danny. I am in my third year of the program. I am actually from Cusco, Peru, but I live in Maplewood, New Jersey, and my areas of interest are international economics in the U.S. and China relations, as well as the southern region of Latin America. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. OK, DJ, you're up. Hello, my name is DJ Matos. I'm a sophomore and I'm in the three plus three program for the Bachelor of Science and Juris Doctorate program. Drew, you're next. Hi, I'm Drew Starbuck. Uh, I'm a freshman in the School of Diplomacy, and uh, my interests are in the Inter Middle Eastern relations, relations, and I'm from Colby, Kansas. Good. Jarrett. Hey, good afternoon. My name is Jarrett Dang, and I'm a senior in the School of Diplomacy. Um, I'm originally from Diamond Bar, California, which is a tiny town outside of LA, and um, I'm interested in global press freedom. Okay. Jasmine. Hello, my name is Jasmine DeLeon. I'm a freshman in the School of Diplomacy. I'm from Bridgewater, New Jersey, and I'm interested in journalism and technology. Jack. Hi, I'm John Christman. I go by Jack. I'm from Nutley, New Jersey, and I'm double majoring with diplomacy and international relations and modern languages with focuses in Russian and Chinese. Oh. Katie. Hi, my name is Katie Strick. I am a junior. I am really interested in international law um, and also learning the ch Chinese language and culture. Did I miss something? I feel like I missed something. Where you're from? Oh, and I'm from Central Jersey. Keshav. 
Hello, my name is Keshav, and I'm a sophomore in the 3 plus 3 dual degree program. Um, I'm from Whippany, New Jersey, and I'm interested in climate and environmental issues and the role of interfaith organizations in the international system. Um, thank you for taking your time to be here today. Thank you. Kristen. Hi, thank you for being here today. My name is Kristen McGuire. I'm a freshman in the School of Diplomacy. Um, from Plumington, New Jersey, and my main areas of interest are human rights and economic development. Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren Marie Diawatin. I'm a student in Seton Hall's 3 plus 3 dual degree program for international relations and law, and my current interests are in um, humanitarian rights as well as global health crises. Megan. Hi, I'm Meg Garin. I am a sophomore from Northeastern Pennsylvania, and my primary interests are in public health. Mia. Hi, thank you for joining us. I'm Mia DePaula, and I am a junior in the School of Diplomacy. I'm interested in sustainable development, particularly education and equality. Nazar. I'm Nazar Nakarachi. I'm from Boston, um, diplomacy major. I have minors in cybersecurity and French, and I'm interested in the Foreign Service, so I'm really happy to have you here. Okay. Molly. Hi, I'm Molly. I'm a freshman in the School of Diplomacy, and I'm in the 3 plus 3 dual degree law program. And I'm from, I think I already said I'm from South Jersey, but I'm not quite sure what I'm interested in yet. Nandini. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Nandini Johnny. I am a sophomore in the School of Diplomacy, and I am interested in sustainable development and law. Peter. Uh, so my name is Peter Egerding. I'm a junior studying diplomacy and philosophy. I'm interested in Eastern Europe, and I'm, I'm studying Russian right now. Um, and I just want to say thank you for your time as well. I'm, I'm really interested to, uh, to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Shweta. Hi, thank you for being here today. Um, my name is Shweta. I'm a freshman in the School of Diplomacy. Um, I'm from Central Jersey, and my interests are in international women's rights and journalism. Sophia. Hi, I'm Sophia. Uh, I'm a sophomore. I live in Morris County, New Jersey, and I'm interested in pretty much anything involving the Middle East. <laughs> Thomas. Hi, I'm Thomas Johnson. I'm in the 3 plus 2 master's program for diplomacy and I'm from near Kansas City, Missouri. And my interest is mainly in conflict and security in Eastern Europe. Wesley. Hi, I'm Wesley. I'm a senior uh, from New Jersey and I'm um, currently interested in corporate social responsibility policy. Okay, did I miss anyone? Sorry, I joined uh, a little late, um, but uh, my name is Joseph McKenna. I am a junior at the School of Diplomacy, um, and my interest lies with um, international cooperation and the interactions between uh, different regime types. Okay. Okay, thank you, everyone. So I am going to now... Um, Let's see, I'm going to spotlight you, Russell, so everybody can see you well and uh, and let you go ahead and tell us about your experience. OK, <laughs> well, listening to all the students, uh, I think I have a fair amount in common with quite a few of you. All right, so where do we begin? Well, first and foremost, you probably want to get an idea as to what brought me to the Foreign Service. So. I study political science at the University of Pennsylvania. And so you might think that I immediately joined the Foreign Service or developed an interest in diplomacy uh, upon graduation. But if you did think that, you would be wrong. I actually detoured from my interest in political science, and I had the opportunity to work in the television business for approximately 20 years uh, in the New York area. 
uh, you're probably familiar with uh, the public radio and television station, uh, WNYC, which is based in lower Manhattan. Well, I worked there for three years. And uh, while I was there, uh, during a very interesting period in, in New York, I thought I would like the opportunity to work at a much larger place. And I sent out my resumes and my uh, tape, just as everyone else does. And uh, in my case, uh, ABC Sports reached out to me, uh, asked me to come in for an interview, and I interviewed with uh, their vice president, uh, took a little sports quiz, and uh, they offered me a job. And being a longtime sports fan, um, I would say that uh, politics and sports are probably my two greatest passions in life. I could not pass up the opportunity to work for ABC, and it was a great experience. During that time, I traveled throughout the world. Uh, you know, uh, ABC is famous for the wide world of sports, a program that no longer airs, but uh, it did uh, during the time in which I was there. And that was sort of one of the signature uh, programs for ABC. That and the other things that we broadcast, whether it was a Super Bowl, a World Series, uh, college football, college basketball, etc., uh, allowed me to travel throughout the world and have a great, wonderful experience being exposed to a variety of cultures and getting a sense of basically how to work with people all over the world, because we oftentimes send relatively small teams to these various locations and we work with uh, the people there, be it a, a local broadcaster or be it in the case of uh, your typical college football town, uh, picking up uh, some of the students there to help with our production as well. So it uh, gave me a lot of experience in what I'll call management and leadership and that sort of thing. But the television business can be taxing both uh, in terms of the pressure that you're under, the constant travel, and oftentimes people, frankly speaking, burn out, whether we're talking about television sports or maybe we're talking about television news. And then typically uh, people move on to other things that will allow them to have a greater uh, work-life balance. So, you know, your, your typical television producer may go off and now do public relations. Maybe we'll work for a political candidate. Maybe you'll do a job um, now doing uh, PR or something like that with a corporation. In other words, work at more nine to five type thing. And uh, at a certain point in your life, that may be what you want to do. Well, I wasn't quite prepared to do those things, but I knew that I didn't want to do television for the rest of my professional life. So I had to consider what would I want to do? What did I enjoy about what I was doing at ABC? And what type of career might fit for me as I move on to do something else? And fortunately, Seton Hall advertised that it was starting this new program in starting a diplomacy school. I saw that advertisement and I said, wow, this is something I might be interested in doing. And so I came to, uh, or went to Seton Hall, I spoke to someone there who recommended that I apply, told me that uh, taking the GRE would not be necessary since I had uh, so much professional experience. I applied, I was accepted, and I started taking classes there. Seton Hall worked out really well for me in comparison to going to another school that would have a international relations program, like say, you know, Columbia has a program or NYU has a program, um, but they don't necessarily have programs that would have worked for me while I was also working. Seton Hall did have uh, classes that I could attend after work. And so for me, that was sort of a godsend. I could do something that I was very, very motivated to do, but it would also work with my schedule. 
And so I graduated uh, from Seton Hall, I believe it was in 2003. While I was there, I took the Foreign Service test, something that was actually recommended to me by your current dean, who is Courtney Smith, I believe. Well, when I was attending, um, he was not the dean. <laughs> he was a uh, professor and he taught one of my, uh, I think one of my first year classes. And uh, he told me that he had taken the foreign service uh, test, but decided that he wanted to go into academia. So he didn't pursue it. Well, but he recommended that if diplomacy was something that I wanted to do, uh, he highly recommended taking the test and see and let's see what happens. Well, I did. Um, I also, after passing it, you go through an oral exam, uh, which is sort of a combination interview. And also, at least at that time, they put you through a variety of scenarios to see, uh, I guess, what your thinking would be like. And I passed that. But if you know anything about the federal government, you also know that you're not necessarily hired right away. And in my case, it took approximately a year before I received another call uh, asking me, was I still interested? If I was, uh, would I be able to join their next what we call a 100 class? That's sort of a basic training for diplomats. And I said yes, and I'd be willing to. And I started uh, roughly and I guess it was July of 2004. It was interesting that uh, once I started A100, maybe it was about a week or so into it, I got a call from my wife who said that uh, ESPN International wanted to know if I were to come in for an interview. And that I was because while I was waiting that year for the Foreign Service uh, to get back to me, or the State Department to get back to me, I was looking at other opportunity as well. And so uh, one of the places that I actually interviewed was ESPN International. And uh, at that point, I had already made a commitment and I told my wife I was going to stick by my commitment to the U.S. State Department. Fortunately, I have no regrets and um, I had a good, a good career in the State Department. Where have I served? I served in Honduras first as a consul officer, then went to Peru. I think I heard someone say they was from Cusco. Served there as well as a consular officer. So why consular officer? Well, in the State Department, um, you sort of pay your dues initially by serving as a consular officer. Um, we need lots of them, and we utilize our young officers to serve on what we call the line, doing those interviews um, with all those people who would like to get a visa to come to the United States. Why do we need so many of them? Well, that was kind of a uh, byproduct of the unfortunate incident that took place on 9-11. Uh, speaking of 9-11, I actually happened to be at Seton Hall that morning. And then I headed into uh, New York on the train and happened to arrive there around the time in which I believe one of the first buildings fell. Um, I had heard on my way in from uh, Seton Hall that a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center. And like many people, I thought that was probably an accident. Uh, I thought it was an accident because one of my colleagues at ABC had actually taken me on a uh, flying lesson. And we had flown over Manhattan in his small plane. So I thought, yeah, I could imagine it happening where somebody may have flown their small plane into one of those buildings. But of course, as we all know, it wasn't a small plane and it wasn't an accident. But I also bring that up because if, as I was attending Seed Hall at that time, that's why I was there that morning, that also served as motivation for me to continue to finish at Seed Hall. Um, and get into the Foreign Service or do something along those types because it convinced me that what I was trying to do was important. That there were a lot of people around the world who had uh, misperceptions about the United States and what we were trying to do in the world. And of course, being a student of history, I know we've made our mistakes in various parts of the world. 
we're not, certainly not a perfect country and we haven't had a perfect foreign policy. But I know that we are or were uh, also doing some good things. And nothing in my experience uh, in the State Department has convinced me otherwise that in the main, we are trying to accomplish very, very good things. And uh, people around the world have benefited as a, as a result. So besides uh, serving in Latin America, I've served here in Washington uh, in the Bureau of uh, African Affairs. Um, following my time here, I went to Africa and I've served in Cote d'Ivoire and I've served in Nigeria. In my time in Africa, especially, which is a continent that's filled with young people, really brought home um, some quotes that I saw that described what at least those people thought leadership was all about. And one of them actually is a New Jerseyan, uh, Bill Bradley, former basketball player of the New York Knicks, uh, served as a senator from New Jersey. And he talked about what he thought leadership was. And I want to utilize one of his quotes that I can find it quickly. Ah. Leadership is unlocking people's potential to, to become better. Now, why do I find that to be particularly appropriate? Because when I served in Africa, this uh, continent where the average age of the population is less than 30 years old. And I met a lot of those young people. And a lot of those young people, unfortunately, in their particular cultural and political context, don't have the same feeling that most Americans like yourselves who believe that basically what you can accomplish in life in large measure, maybe not totally, but in large measure is up to you. How hard you work, what type of education you get. Many of them don't really believe that. They believe that they are constrained Maybe it's constrained by their age, because we're talking about societies where uh, many people believe that uh, young people don't count very much. That people who are much older naturally should have much more influence on their society. Societies who oftentimes believe women don't count for very much. They're male dominant societies and oftentimes quite proud of it. Who believe that those who are wealthy should have more influence than those who are not? Maybe those who are in cities count for more than those who are in rural areas. Where certain tribes, and yes, they still use the word tribes count for certain count for more than others. Certain religions count for more than others. Okay. That's the context that they live in. But as an American, without necessarily contradicting people, because you don't really want to be in a situation where you are telling people how they should live. But you can offer them a different viewpoint, a different perspective. Many of them believe, number one, that in the United States, we're not as diverse a country as we actually are. How many times as a consular officer, when we unfortunately oftentimes are disappointing people. And I think uh, your colleague from Peru might have a good sense of what I'm saying. 
that most of the people who come and apply for a visa don't receive one. Okay, so we're disappointing people on, on a regular basis. Okay, but we have to sort of do that in a in a polite and courteous fashion. But that sort of goes with the job. Okay, but back to these young people. When I say, oh, I got. To, I was telling you about why people don't believe that we are as diverse as we are. Because when I'm serving in a place like maybe it could be Peru, it could be Honduras. When we disappoint people, oftentimes they will say, can I speak to a real American? And what do they mean by that? What's who's a real American? Well, in the eyes of many people, the real American is a Caucasian American. Okay, yes. They don't believe we are as diverse as this group of people that I'm looking at right now. They still believe in maybe a 1950s, 1940s view of America because they don't know America quite as well as they may think they do because they think of America as what they see on television, movies, etc. So one of our jobs is to try to explain to people what America is really like. Now, even though I served as a consul officer early on in my career, I'm a public diplomacy officer by cone. And you're saying, what's a cone? Well, in the State Department, we have specialties five principal specialties. Political is one, and you're most familiar with that because first and foremost, uh, people think of diplomats as people who negotiate, you know, treaties and things of that nature. For the average person overseas, actually, they believe that the consular officer, the one who hands out the visas, is probably the most important thing we do. And that's natural because that's the uh, American diplomat that they come into contact most times. There are management officers, those who are responsible for the logistics of uh, supporting us overseas. Because, yes, it, we may be handing on visas or actually approving visas. We may be doing political work, but we have to live someplace and we have a motor pool so we can actually get to places. Um, we have to manage people who uh, provide the security at our facilities or clean our facilities or people who are providing the technological support for our facilities. So management is a cone as well. And we have public diplomacy officers those who speak on behalf of the United States government overseas, those who run exchange programs. Those are the activities that you do in the public diplomacy cone, and that's what I did when I was in places like Iraq and uh, when I was in, in Africa, as an example, and a bit um, when I was in Latin America. And then finally, we have economic officers those who analyze economic trends, those who work with American businesses overseas, those who provide information on foreign companies who may be interested in investing in the United States. Okay, those are our five cons. Another person who says something that I think was very, very relevant to what we have to do overseas from a leadership standpoint is actually Douglas MacArthur. And as a diplomat, you wonder what might I find particularly relevant coming from such a, uh, a uh, obvious military um, official. Well, let's take a listen. A true leader has the confidence to stand alone, the courage to make tough decisions, and the compassion to listen to the needs of others. He does not set out to be a leader, 
but becomes one by the equality of his actions and the integrity of his intent. I find that very relevant. When we're working overseas, besides representing the United States, and we take that very, very seriously. You find yourself very, very early on heading up teams. You as an American officer will oftentimes find yourself being the leader of a team that might be composed of Americans, but also locally employed staff. That means the people from that country who work for the U.S. Embassy or the U.S. Consulate. Okay. No matter whether you've been in the State Department maybe for three years, I'm assuming now you've done a tour or two, or you've been there 10 years or 20 years, you're heading up that team or that section. Especially when you're a young officer, that's a pretty heady responsibility. You have to represent all of the qualities that we want a diplomat to convey to your team and to the people that you are dealing with. If you're a consular officer to those people who come and see America through you each and every day. If you are a public diplomacy officer, as I said, you may be out speaking to various audiences about the United States, about our culture, but also about our policies. Policies that you may not necessarily agree with. Okay, but that is your responsibility. Okay, if you're a management officer and I told you you are responsible for resources, be it people or be it funds. Okay. And human beings being human beings, you may find yourself in a situation where you detect there are malfeasance taking place. And you have the responsibility to maybe investigate and maybe report that malfeasance, whether it is being done by an American or some of your locally employed staff to the proper authorities. And then people, if they're found that malfeasance took place, they are punished accordingly. That's the integrity portion of leadership. Again, I've seen young officers have to deal with these sort of situations as well as those who have been there for maybe 20 years. I use myself just as a small example because I haven't had to deal with some of the things that my other colleagues have had to deal with. But when I arrived in Peru, in my first week or so, we had an earthquake. All of a sudden, you are responsible for finding out the condition of American citizens and trying to see that they are taken care of, or at minimum reporting back to Washington about what is taking place there so the United States can provide assistance. During my time in Iraq, violence was taking place and some of my staff members were caught up in that violence or their family members. And you have to show the proper compassion for them during that sort of a situation. When I was in Iraq, uh, excuse me, when I was in Cote d'Ivoire, we had a terrorist incident actually in the town that we were visiting that particular that particular day. And you find yourself in a situation where one, you have to ensure your own safety, ensure the safety of your colleagues. 
but maintain your composure because now you have to flip the switch and you have to report to Washington what is taking place there and what is required um, from your uh, your colleagues back here in Washington. Okay. Earthquake, war zone, terrorism. I'm sure uh, many of my colleagues can find uh, stories far more exciting than I. But that is the nature of being a State Department officer. So leadership is part of the job. No matter how, many, how much time you spent um, in the State Department. And I'm here to say that if you choose to go that route, just as I did, you can handle it. Again, regardless of whether you've been there for a few years or you've been there for a very long time. But what are the things that I think you have to acquire along the way? You're going to have to be able to maintain composure you are going to have to be able to manage to absorb information. You are going to have to be able to communicate, be it uh, speaking or written. And yes, you're going to have to project integrity. And I don't mean that as a throwaway line. Just as I said that at times you may encounter malfeasance, and that is a very real situation in the federal government where all of a sudden where we consider a million dollars to be pocket change and to deal with uh, maybe a few million dollars as your budget for your particular section is sort of par for the course. And for the entire State Department, all of a sudden we're talking about billions, well, millions, yeah, millions of dollars. For the state, for the, for the federal government, of course, we're talking billions, but yeah, it'll be uh, millions for the State Department. And that's your responsibility. You have to take seriously the spending of the taxpayers' dollars. Now, again, in certain parts of the world, they think public expenditures, no big deal. You sort of do what you want to do with that. But as an American, you know that's not quite the way it works in our government. Okay. You are going to encounter at times people who are above you that don't exemplify some of the things that I just described. As a assistant to one of our uh, high officials in the State Department, I traveled with him often. And one of his missions in, in, in one of our trips was to basically fire an ambassador because he had stepped over that line. Integrity is extremely important. Now, I did, probably didn't imagine all these things when I was at Seton Hall. But I really appreciate my experience there. What I was able to learn from professors like uh, Dr. Smith, that gave me a good sense of some of the issues that I would encounter, that gave me the encouragement to go ahead and pursue a career in the State Department, despite the fact that I was working in something totally different at the time. And I want to encourage any and all of you who are interested in similar careers, be it in the State Department or be it in some other aspect of international relations, to do so. Because I can certainly testify to the fact that we need very, very good people. 
we need creative people, we need confident people, we need people with the technological skills that are sort of second nature uh, to young people and a lot more uh, or difficult to handle for people of a certain age. <laughs> we need you uh, representing our country. Again, showing again that diversity um, that we have in our country. Uh, to show that we care about the issues um, that affect the entire world. Uh, things like climate change. Uh, I think uh, one of you mentioned that that was one of your your interests and that happens to be one of the areas that I'm working in in my current position in the State Department. Um, you talked about, uh, I think, development issues. And without a doubt, no matter where we are in the world, that is also a major concern. So the State Department changes. We change uh, at times in terms of our priorities with a different administration. But what we are always doing is working and working hard to both satisfy the priorities of our own nation, but also to help make the world a better place. That's what has motivated me throughout my time in the State Department. And I think it has been one of the most fulfilling things that I've had the opportunity to do. So thank you very much for your time. And I would certainly like to uh, take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Russell. Russell. I appreciate you being so candid with our uh, with our students, and I see the hands are going up uh, very quickly. So I'm I couldn't see who was first, so I'm just going to take the first person who's on my list here. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Hi, Russell. Thank you so much for coming. I really, really enjoyed um, your presentation. And before we move into the more leadership focused questions, I have more of a personal one because I am interested in the Foreign Service. So what can someone like myself who is um, in their undergraduate studies right now uh, do to kind of get the ball rolling with potentially joining the for or uh, taking the test for the Foreign Service and doing a career like that? OK, great question. Now, uh, full disclosure, not only am I a Foreign Service uh, officer, but my daughter decided that she wanted to pursue this career. So she became a Pickering Fellow um, as an undergraduate. Um, so she will go into A100, again, that training course I was telling you about uh, this fall after she finishes her uh, studies at Georgetown University. She's uh, studying Middle Eastern studies. I think someone said that they wanted they were interested in everything pertaining to the Middle East and she speaks fluent Arabic. So uh, that's her career choice. My son currently works for USAID. Um, so he also wants to pursue an international career. He just took the Foreign Service test because he has decided that he would like to join the, the Foreign Service. All right, now, in both cases, they join me when I uh, overseas. They live with me overseas while I, once I started my foreign service career. And both of them hated it initially, okay? Because we were living in central New Jersey. They were typical suburban kids you know, playing in Little League and soccer and all that sort of stuff and did not understand why the heck I want to leave that to take them overseas. OK, hated it. OK. But eventually. Like the fact that they learned foreign languages, my daughter is fluent in Spanish also. My son speaks Spanish and French. And once they returned back to the United States, saw how different they were than their typical <clears throat> high school uh, compatriots. And then eventually um, their 
their college classmates. They appreciated the experience in retrospect. Okay. Besides them studying uh, international affairs in college, they started reading my books as well. Okay. They started reading The Economist. Okay. Reading the New York Times on a regular basis. Okay. Getting all that general international uh, affairs type material that I recommend for you also. But also stay really abreast on what I'll call the typical cultural things. Now, I don't know what you like to do, what you're interested in, in terms of music or or uh, history or drama or whatever happens to you, films, etc. What I am saying is besides reading The Economist, those things that you like, the music, the films, etc., will also be useful for you. Some of the questions on the foreign service test are going to relate to cultural things. Okay. Let's say you pass the test, you get into the foreign service. You will also be able to draw upon that in how you work with foreign audiences who will be terribly interested in those sort of things about the United States. So know your history and know your culture and things like that, because it will be very, very, very valuable for you. Thank you so much. Very insightful. Thank you. You're welcome. Jarrett, next question. Um, just want to say, first of all, thank you, Mr. Brooks, very much for taking the time today. I found all of your insights very helpful because I'm also like Jack interested in the State Department and I think your career track in particular is very interesting to me because uh, last spring I did an internship at USUN in the uh, press uh, press section okay. so I'm um, really interested in public diplomacy so I think my question actually relates to that and I wanted to ask you why you chose public diplomacy um, over the other cones like political and economic and what is you know, if you could draw on one, what is the most rewarding thing you found about public diplomacy in your time at the State Department? OK. Like most people. Um, I thought also of the State Department pretty much from the political standpoint. That's what diplomats do. They meet uh, fellow diplomats. They uh, work out treaties, negotiate things, you know, the things that we normally associate with that profession. But when I came down to do the oral examination uh, following uh, having taken the written test, one of the people that interviewed me said, you have a television background. That's very, very interesting to us. What you ought to do <laughs> is be a public diplomacy officer. You have a perfect background for that. OK, so that's why he turned me around from what I thought I wanted to do. Now, in the State Department, we have a corporate culture just like if you were working for IBM or Toyota or some other company or ABC, all right? There's a corporate culture. And in the State Department, corporate culture, again, the political cone is the traditionally predominant cone, traditionally. Because again, just like I thought of that as being what diplomats do, that's a lot of the culture that still exists within the State Department, still. But there's a shift taking place. Because we now recognize contrary to years past, if we are going to be influential in the world, we can't just talk to other diplomats. We have to engage with foreign audiences. And foreign audiences are more than just our fellow diplomats. 
They're more than just the NGO community. They're the business community. Maybe in some places there's student groups out there that can be very influential. They're tech audiences. You know, in the State Department, you say we utilize Twitter, we utilize Facebook, we utilize pretty much all of the different uh, technological uh, tools that are out there. Some we do better at than others. But we try to stay on top of what is effective in terms of communicating. And I'm sure that's going to continue to change because, again, we have to reach out to young people. We have to reach out to a variety of different audiences, depending on who we're trying to reach and what message we're trying to convey. Awesome. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Peter, you're up next. Thank you again for, for your time today. Um, I'm also interested in the State Department. I think it's been a fantastic, you know, the very informative um, discussion. Um, I wanted to ask, and you, you answered it partially um, when answering Jack's question, but what are some of the best sources that you have for information about diplomacy and about all this? You mentioned The Economist and New York Times, but do you have any books or podcasts you really like listening to that might help somebody out? Hmm. There's a podcast called American Diplomat, and uh, it features basically current and former ambassadors. Uh, one of the most distinguished American ambassadors by the name of William Burns has a book out called The Back Channel, and he talks about his career in diplomacy. He was I may get this wrong, but I think I may be a three time ambassador. Um, most importantly for you right now, he's about to become the next CIA director. Um, and uh, he rose to be deputy secretary of state. Why is that significant? Because for a career diplomat, usually the highest rank that you will achieve is to be the undersecretary for political affairs. Ordinarily. The position of secretary and the position of deputy secretary ordinarily goes to political appointees. So the fact that he rose to the deputy secretary level is uh, particularly unique and impressive. And that's why he is considered one of the greatest diplomats of his time. So that's one book I would certainly recommend. You also might want to look at uh, Present at the Creation, which is the famous book by Dean Atchison. Also considered one of the great diplomats. So those are just a couple. Thank you. Daniela. Hello. Um, thank you, Mr. Brooks. Very insightful, like my peers have said. Um, I've also found very um, interesting your insights about Peru and your experiences, and I think a lot of it resonates with what I still see in how they view America, um, unfortunately. But my question um, is about what are some experience that you had prior to uh, training to become a diplomat that have allowed you to that allowed you to expand your understanding of multicultural ideas and engaging with people with different backgrounds. OK. Probably one of my best experiences or useful, most useful experiences is uh, while I was working with ABC, I traveled a great deal in the United States. I mentioned that I uh, did college football, so that means I traveled to your typical college football towns, you know, Columbus, Ohio, Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, uh, Lincoln, Nebraska. You connect these schools with football, right? Uh, basketball, uh, schools like uh, Kansas or North Carolina. I said I did uh, Major League Baseball, so that's, you know, 
Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco. All right, what's the connection here? By doing sports in the United States, I probably travel to more states than the average American. I had a good opportunity to learn about the diversity of Americans. I'm not just talking about racially, ethnically. I'm talking about in terms of different foods that people like, different types of music that people like. You know, what <laughs> you learn a lot in your typical college bar or whatever. Because I'm like going, I'm doing this when I was like, you know, yeah, uh, mid twenties, mid to late twenties. Okay, so I'm still not so old <laughs> as compared to the students that I was around. Okay, I learned a lot about my own country, and so when I went and now I'm speaking to groups of students um, at an American center, uh, whether it be in Lima, Peru or whether it be in Abidjan, Cote d'Ivoire, whether it be in Lagos, Nigeria, I can speak pretty authoritatively about the variety and diversity of Americans. Okay? And I found that extremely useful. Thank you so much for your answer. You're welcome. Jasmine. Hi, Mr. Burke. Thank you again for making time to speak with us. I am curious to know why you decided to make a career change. What specifically about your job made you decide to come to the Seton Hall School of Diplomacy and become a Foreign Service Officer? And I'm also curious to know why, when you did have other job offers, um, why you decided to stick with being in the Foreign Service. I can imagine it wasn't an easy decision. Like you said, it had an effect on your family. Sure. Okay. So what was it about uh, ABC? You probably think, what did, what was happening? Why did you want to leave that job? Well, in the in American business, things change. Okay, technology causes change. Okay, and in the television business, so we're talking about the early 2000s, late 90s, yeah, late 90s, early 2000s. That industry is going through a, a lot of change. Basically, you're phasing out uh, expensive uh, expensive full-time employees in that industry, and you're moving more toward a freelance orientation. Okay. Why have on your payroll? Uh, expensive union employees doing your technical work when you can hire basically freelancers. You don't have to pay them expensive health benefits. Okay. They work for you for to do a particular job. And then they move on. That's the business model that that industry is finding increasingly economical. Not owning big production trucks to do like a typical college football game, college basketball game, you rent them. Okay. Again, they're finding that much more economical. Okay. As opposed to networks dominating the sports industry, ESPN had come into its own. You take ESPN for granted now. I recall when it was basically a startup. Okay. ESPN is based in Bristol, Connecticut. Much cheaper real estate out there as you need to expand to be able to cover all these programs. And as opposed to spending a lot of money purchasing programs, ESPN came up with the model of why don't we just own the program? So we created X games and things like that, that we own. Okay, so the industry was changing. 
Also, the industry was shedding people. Just like other industries that determined that they could do more with fewer people. When you see your industry changing. It's probably wise to think about what you are going to do differently. How you are going to prepare yourself to do something different within that industry or what you might be able to do outside of that industry. So that's what I concluded. In terms of uh, recognizing that I was going to now leave uh, ABC or do something different and choosing the foreign service and taking into consideration what impact that would have on my family. Well, I thought that it could be very beneficial for my family. As much as I enjoy living in New Jersey and my kids definitely enjoy their lifestyle you know, as young children there, I thought I could grow and I thought they could grow along with me. I thought if they were exposed to living overseas, they would benefit from the experience. If they had the opportunity to learn different languages, they would benefit. If they had the opportunity to just be exposed to something outside of their comfort zone, it would help them. Again, if you spoke to them at that time, they would have totally disagreed. If you speak to them now, as one, as I said, speaks Arabic, and the other one has uh, committed himself to working uh, internationally. Most recently, before he came back to uh, the United States and worked for USAID, he was working in South Sudan. Kid who did not want to leave New Jersey was working in South Sudan. I think they did OK. Shweta, yeah. go ahead. Um, thank you uh, so much for coming to speak with us today. I really enjoyed what you had to say. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, um, I'm really passionate about women's rights. So my question is about that. Um, I know that in recent years, women have been you know, breaking through a lot more and doing a lot more on the international stage. Um, but my question is, what do you think is the sort of next big glass ceiling, so to speak, that the next generation of women should should be able to break? Wow, that's a tough question. All right, so I have an interesting perspective on that. On one hand, yes, depending on where I am in the world, I see women doing incredible things and the world has really opened up to them in terms of opportunities. But also, a year ago was working in Nigeria, a country where large numbers of the population don't believe it's very important to educate girls. We're in the north of the country, the statistics for education are probably worse than Afghanistan and Syria, where there's still uh, female genital mutilation, where there's still child marriage, at least to some degree where uh, a lot of uh, young girls are basically uh, offered to human traffickers by their own families in order to increase the family's standard of living. It's, 
as much as I'm willing to admit that, yes, women, depending on where you are, have accomplished a great deal. I've also seen, especially for young girls, but also even adult women in Nigeria, how far we have to go. In Nigeria, one of the most dangerous things a woman can do is have a child because of the poor quality of health care, where women are literally risking their lives to be in a hospital attempting to deliver a child. We have a long way to go in many parts of the world. Thank you. Um, do you mind if I ask a quick follow up? Sure. Um, 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 again, I deal with journalists all the time. <laughs> it kind of goes with the territory. <laughs> um, the so. So I, I fully understand that, um, you know, around the world, girls have a long way to go, but as um, hopefully the next generation of female diplomats and international leaders are, you know, starting their journeys, um, what as female leaders can we do to, you know, improve the situation that maybe um, the previous generation of women couldn't do or even men couldn't do? Is there something in particular that you think we will be able to accomplish in the next um, like generation of women? In large measure, that sort of depends on you and the next generation of women. I think you're going to have greater opportunities without a doubt. Okay? In the State Department, it has come a long way. I mean, I'm not quite so old that I recall this, but I've been told about it, that when um, uh, women uh, joined their husbands in the State Department, um, they were only seen as being able to host parties. Okay, um, They were not seen as being potential diplomats. Uh, we're not encouraged to, to pursue careers in diplomacy. And then, you know, uh, gradually that has changed uh, initially uh, with a few uh, uh, diplomats, uh, female diplomats. And now I think in most A100 classes, probably the majority are female. I think that's... I think that's pretty accurate. Certainly in terms of the leadership of the State Department, women occupy, I, I don't believe there is a position that, you know, is, is close to women at all, whether we're talking about uh, diplomatic security officers or we're talking about political officers, if we're talking about management, regardless, we see women in, in all types of positions. Now, once a woman occupies those positions, is she expected to basically be exactly like a man in terms of mindset? That's one approach. But I think a better approach is if a woman brings a different perspective to how to deal with the issues that will come up. When we're negotiating things like nuclear nonproliferation or uh, conflict uh, mitigation, and reconciliation in a place like South Sudan, since my son was recently there. By reaching out to the female population in that country, can we have a greater effect in trying to make disparate groups recognize that they have more to gain by working together than in 
conflict. Most of the time, to be honest, women are not necessarily given a lot of consideration in those sort of negotiations. But maybe that should not be the case. Maybe we should make a greater effort to reach out to them and utilize their influence upon the rest of their group, be it their husbands or be it their children, who may now understand that it really does not make sense to continue this particular conflict. And maybe we can have greater impact in terms of our economic and social development if we work together. So if women utilize maybe a different perspective than their male counterparts, maybe they can have a greater effect on some of the things that we're trying to accomplish. Thank you. Sure. Jasmine, did you have a follow up? I see your hand. I did, if that's all right. Um, Mr. Brooks, you said in your previous answer that you need to be able to change if you see your industry changing. How has working for the Foreign Service changed since you started and is it changing now? And also, how did you deal with that? Okay. This, it definitely has changed, um, not just during my time. Like, I'll, I'll tell you this famous story. Uh, when Colin Powell, who you're familiar with, arrived in the State Department as Secretary of State, the use of computers was not widespread in the State Department yet. Okay. He came coming from the military and then I guess he spent maybe a little time in the private sector where, you know, I guess computers at that time at least the, your basic old style Wayne computers. This is before, you know, you had this, the small uh, desktops that we're all familiar with now, um, or, or laptops, I should say. Uh, you know, at least he was comfortable with those. And he comes into a bureaucracy where maybe they had like maybe a computer in a section, as opposed to having one on everyone's desk, okay? And he said, basically, what's going on here? We have to change this. And now in the State Department, just like every other uh, uh, industry or company, or whatever, yeah, computers are widespread. Now, we still have our problems. Uh, we have to worry about cybersecurity, as you know, from the, the most recent Russian hack, OK? government in general does not stay uh, up to speed as compared to private industry in terms of the introduction of new technology, mostly because the acquisition process in the government is so much more time consuming than it is in private industry. But nevertheless, as compared to where we were 20, 30 years ago, has been a quantum leap. And the fact that we now recognize that we can send cables via computer systems versus cables via teletype machines is a big change. The fact that now we recognize that we as a government agency also have to be uh, just as familiar with social media as any other company out there where the State Department is utilizing Instagram, uh, maybe not TikTok because uh, you know, of our concerns about uh, the Chinese, but nevertheless, we're uh, trying to stay on top of uh, social media um, just as everyone else is. These are huge cultural changes for government bureaucracy. Do you think that the government is doing a good job with the change that the change in challenges that are presented from social media? Who? 
Are we doing a good job? I guess what could you do better? Well, that's really uh, a question that has to be answered by the consumer rather than the producer. Uh, I know being a public uh, diplomat that we have uh, lots of people working very, very hard in trying to deliver those messages each and every day. But the best judge of how well they're doing is not really the people who are producing the messages. It's really those who are consuming the messaging. You can tell me whether we're doing a better job than I can. Okay. Now, you can, all right, so I'll perform a, a little small test here. If I ask you to find the State Department on Instagram, is it readily available to you? How often do you go onto the State Department's website? Do you utilize the State Department's Facebook page? Do you know that practically every U.S. mission has a Facebook page? If that question was directed at me, I don't. OK, so therefore, <laughs> we have a little more work to do to make sure that people of your age know these things. But uh, at the same time, as someone who's in the School of Diplomacy, you also need to research and seek out those things. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, I don't see any more questions, so thank you so much for being with us today, Mr. Brooks. It was wonderful to have you uh, speak to our students. I know they uh, got a lot of out of the um, session. I certainly learned a lot. Um, you have, you know, great richness in your storytelling that uh, is really a pleasure to hear. Um, so already I've had comments come back to me about how uh, wonderful your talk has been and how much they've enjoyed it. So thank you for being with us today. And I hope you will, uh, you know, continue to keep in touch with us and and uh, come back and speak to our students again sometime soon. I look forward to it. It's been my pleasure. You've had a you have some great students that you're working with. Uh, they had some great questions, uh, certainly as a public diplomacy uh, specialist. This is the sort of thing that I should be doing. And um, so it's always a pleasure to sort of uh, brush up on my skills, I guess you would say. OK, well, thanks again, everybody. Have a great weekend and happy, uh, happy President's Day. You too. Take care, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you so much. Thank you.